We will um, move on um, and we will now ask um, uh, Kenneth Benedict, uh, uh, who is the executive director and publisher of the Bulletin of um, uh, Atomic Scientists. And she came to the Bulletin from the MacArthur Foundation, where she directed the International Peace and Security Programme uh, from 92 to 2005. She has been quoted in the USA Today, the Chicago Tribune, the Village Voice, Los Angeles Times, and Congressionally, Congressional Quarterly, among others. And she appears regularly on radio news and talk shows in the United States, uh, Britain, and Australia. We are very happy to uh, welcome you here, uh, Kenneth Benedict, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I, I need to get. Yeah. Pushing. There we go. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're here today to talk about a global risk and opportunity indicator. And um, uh, when Dennis Pamlin called and uh, wanted to talk about the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists and our Doomsday Clock, uh, I was certainly intrigued and very, very eager to talk to him about the global risk uh, indicator. Um, it is a challenge to convey, we think, to uh, public policy leaders as well as the public uh, the dangers that we face um, today. Um, and my job here is to really tell you a story about the doomsday clock and about how the scientists uh, in 1945 began to think about communicating these to the world. Over the past 66 years, the Bulletin has used the doomsday clock uh, to inform the public and policy leaders about the dangers uh, from nuclear weapons. Over this time, the clock has taken on a bit of a life of its own. Um, its power comes, I think, uh, from its origins in the scientist movement that grew out of a reaction to the use of atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II. Uh, many of these scientists who had been seconded to Los Alamos, to Oak Ridge, and other government laboratories during the war returned to their universities. And it was from there that this scientist movement emerged. The University of Chicago, where nuclear fission had first been controlled and where the earliest bombs were designed in the metallurgical lab there, was home to people like John Simpson, Edward Teller, James Franck, and others who helped establish the Bulletin in 1945. Also involved in those early days were Albert Einstein and Robert Oppenheimer, who served as co-chairs of the Board of Sponsors, and the magazine itself was edited by uh, Eugene Rabinowitz, who had worked on the Manhattan Project himself. Not only had scientists and engineers created the most dangerous technology on Earth, they had seen it used on civilian populations without warning. Before those bombs were dropped, and even before the first one was tested in New Mexico in July 1945, scientists at the University of Chicago asked, indeed pleaded, with President Truman not to use the bomb. They knew that the effects would be devastating. In the Franck report, they warned that an arms race would be a likely consequence if nuclear technology and materials were not placed under international control. They were especially worried about an arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union, one that would not be ignited if the weapons were not placed under the control of the UN. This is what they feared and what actually took place, the buildup of nuclear weapons to their peak in 1987. In 1945, as you see on this graph, the US was the only country with the atomic bomb. But it was clear that the Soviet Union would eventually create its own. It was only a matter of time. And it was out of this sense of urgency that the cover design of the bulletin was devised by young artist Martil Langsdorff, the wife of a physicist in the Manhattan Project. She was a landscape artist, uh, not even a designer, but it was her inspiration that brought us um, the doomsday clock. The clock was meant to be a simple design on the June 1947 cover of the new magazine, but when the Soviets tested their first atomic bomb in 1949, someone, and we don't know who, it's part of the mythic lore that we don't understand who, had the idea of moving the minute hand of the clock toward midnight to show how much more dangerous the world had become. 
when the United States and the Soviet Union both tested hydrogen bombs within my nine months of each other, the hand moved to two minutes to midnight, the closest it has ever been. At first, it was the founding editor of the bulletin, Eugene Rabinowitz, who decided when to change the hand of the clock. From conversations with his scientist colleagues and friends in his very large network that extended from US to Russia and Europe and elsewhere, Eugene would track trends, talk to people, get a sense of what was going on, what was on their minds, and came to a judgment about where the world was, whether it was more or less dangerous from the nuclear threat. After Eugene died in 1973, the Bulletin's Board of Directors decided to take up the task together of setting the minute hand. You can see here there was divergence of opinion, um, and the Board discusses uh, today the clock at every meeting, assessing the state of the world and the potential for nuclear disaster. Since the 1947, the clock has moved, the clock hand has moved 20 times toward midnight or away from it to alert the public to the dangers we face. In 2006, the board met several times to consider what other dangers in addition to the threat from nuclear weapons would rise to the level of disastrous and irretrievable harm to humankind. After consulting with a range of experts, including climate scientists like the ones you've heard from uh, today, uh, listening to their, obs to their observations, uh, under trying to understand their projections, the board decided that the disruptive effects of global warming appeared likely to pose the same level of threat as nuclear weapons. The effects would be felt in more severe weather, lower agricultural production, loss of fisheries, sea level rise, mass migration, and new disease vectors, which taken together might even lead to the end of civilization as we now know it. In 2007, we announced that global warming poses a dire threat to human civilization that is second only to nuclear weapons, bringing the clock hand closer to midnight. In 2007, it was five minutes to midnight. When we made the announcement in January 2007, that was one of four top global news events of that day. Moving the minute hand of a mythical clock became a news event. With a redesigned doomsday clock and branding provided by a Madison Avenue firm in New York, Pentagram, we held a simultaneous press conference in Washington, D.C. and London. Stephen Hawking, who is on our board of directors, along with Martin Rees, who then was president of the Royal Society, joined board members Ambassador Tom Pickering and cosmologist Lawrence Krauss and myself to issue the statement. With more than 1,500 news stories, including live streaming of the entire press event by CNN, pieces on BBC, ABC, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, Fox News, live interviews on Al Jazeera, and much more, we helped the world pay attention and raise the issues of nuclear weapons and climate change to the top of the public agenda. In response to that announcement, Republican Senator Dick Lugar and Democratic Senator Evan Bayh use the clock to draw attention to the need to secure loose nuclear material. And U.S. Senator uh, Frank Lautenberg used the clock to draw attention to the need for action on climate change. Inevitably, cartoon journalists also noted the, uh, the bulletin's addition of climate change uh, to our deliberations about the doomsday clock. Although the, uh, the clock derives its authority from the expert community, it is also the people's clock. The symbol has been invoked by political leaders, including Mikhail Gorbachev and George Herbert Walker Bush and Hans Blix, by musicians and artists like Iron Maiden, for those of you who may remember, Smashing Pumpkins and Lincoln Park, and by the creators of the game, A Trivial Pursuit. The success of the doomsday clock is hard to explain, a success that some have called so good it is scary. What we do know is that the clock has captured the imagination of people all over the world. The universal language of time must be part of the story. 
The credibility of the group making the decision is part of it too. These are scientists, many of them Nobel laureates, but they are speaking about the fate of all of us, not just of themselves. They publish information and essays that appear every month and now almost every day in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. You can find data like estimates of nuclear weapons in our nuclear notebook, along with reflections and analysis that place the data in context that help connect the dots. The clock itself is the soul of simplicity, recognizable and accessible in all languages and cultures, and through every means of mass communication and social media available today. And although we write essays to let people know precisely the reasons behind the changes in the hands, the clock's message is understood almost instantly. We are closer or further away from destruction from te technologies of our own making. Recall that Michael Beirut has called the bulletin's clock the most powerful piece of information design of the 20th century. In partnership with the Global Challenges Foundation, the, the bulletin is exploring the clock's continuing power to inform people about the fate of the Earth and to motivate them to pursue the solutions that science and human creativity can offer. But what can the clock's impact over the past 66 years tell us about the value of a communication symbol like the Global Risk and Opportunity Indicator into the future? We certainly welcome the opportunity to address the question and uh, with the goal of creating the most effective tools and messages possible. We're pleased to share the mission of the Foundation uh, to inform business and civic and policy leaders and the public about the risks we face, risks that we have created and that we ourselves can address. Because as we know all too well, it is five minutes to midnight. Thanks very much for the opportunity to, to address this group today, and I look forward to our continued discussions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kenneth Benedict, and um, this is what I call pictures. Uh, that's, uh, thank you for that presentation. Uh, very interesting. What is it that uh, actually could move the hand in the other direction? What has moved the hand in mm. the other direction? Okay. Not closer to midnight? Yes, the time that it was furthest away from midnight was in 1992, after the end of the Cold War. We moved it literally off the chart to 17 minutes to midnight. And um, at that time, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, with uh, signing of the Intermediate uh, Forces Treaty in 1992 between the US and, so and then Russia, uh, we thought uh, we had great grounds for optimism, and indeed, uh, since that time, uh, we have uh, decreased nuclear weapons down from 70, 7 zero, 70,000 to 17,000 in about 20 years. So I think our optimism on that front may have been um, uh, warranted. Uh, I think the, uh, we still have a long way to go. And um, we also uh, believe that climate change, in some ways, pushes the hand towards midnight. Thank you. Are there any questions to uh, Kenneth? I think we uh, all need um, so something strong like coffee, um, and we you will very soon uh, have a coffee break. But. Uh